Hello guys! Welcome back to Nodos Mecha! It's Marco here, and today we work on the largest model I've ever painted for the channel. Nothing beats the sight of a large stomping monster bringing chaos in the middle of the table. And now that I have more time, you'll see many more of these bigger models. So let me know in the comments what you want to see next. Gobsprack, the mouth of Mork, is part of my Cruel Boys open project, where I speed paint in high quality my Age of Sigmar army, adding new models as soon as they come out. So check the playlist up here to watch the full ongoing story. Speed painting units is a simple task, where you easily accept the loss of a certain grade of detail in favor of the general mood and bird's eye view of the troops, but heroes and monsters are always a bit trickier. They must for sure stand out as special focal points on the table, but it's not only a matter of painting them better, because they are still part of an army that have to share the same average look to work as a cohesive visual entity. And as is always true for any gaming model, you want to bring them on the table as quickly as you possibly can. So here are the mental and practical tricks that I use to make this happen. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel. And if you want to support my work, like, comment, share, watch another video, and maybe check my Patreon page, where you can find the real-time footage of my videos with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! You know that I'm not a fan of sub-assemblies. If the eyes can reach a spot, the brush can do it too. And I always prefer to trade a few easy brush strokes with a more cohesive understanding of the general volumes and the flow of lights and shadows. Plus, I really don't like to play with glue around a finished model. But in this case, I would have a small crouch figure nested in the middle of the large open wings. So I build the shaman as a separate model, counting on the pegs under the saddle to make quick visual tests of the general flow. Modern GW kits have a lot of clever solutions to make uh, sims disappear into the natural shapes of the sculpt, but the big volumes of large models are quite unforgiving with seam lines, and you must take care of them. You can easily hide the crimes of a quick uh, speed paint, but uh, you cannot hide a crappy build. For large, problematic seams, I like to use epoxy putties, adding a new extra material that I can sculpt and maybe later sand to the right shape and volume. But working on plastic models and if the gap is just a tight line, I simply use a dense plastic glue as a fluid putty to merge the two sides. The trick works better for organic models and fluid shapes, where some extra subtle texture is not a problem or even a nice bonus. But with a bit of sanding, you can use it also on the flat panels of sci fi armors. I've set my arm in a simple, diffused zenithal light perfect for gaming, that finds its character more in the tones than in a dramatic direction or intensity of the light. And here, the idea of a diffused light bouncing smoothly on these uh, large surfaces is created through the use of a neutral grey over the black primer, producing a soft transition from shadows to mittons. In this specific context of uh, speed painting small trooper models with an airbrush, my reasons to set a sharp uh, pre rendering of values using a black and white sketch are mainly based on the needs of defining volumes and the physical difficulties of uh, quickly adding new layers and information on sometimes microscopic targets. Keeping light and color separated, I have to worry about only one thing at a time. Setting a precise uh, spread sketch is quick and simple, and the transparent paints I like to use in the second stage can easily incorporate the information underneath, giving me the freedom to add a ton of new interesting colors on a close progression that's already mapped out and uh, tightly placed. On uh, large models and monsters where I don't feel the pressure of the small volumes and their little shapes crowded with details, I tend to apply a looser sketch with uh, less focus on the actual volumes and with an early attention on the colors that I'm going to use later. The placement of white in particular is almost entirely influenced by the position of the bright red elements of the scheme. 
You can see here on the wings that I don't really care about the virtual darker value of the lower parts, ideally less exposed to the light coming directly from above. And despite the relative position, I turn them into pure white to support better and add extra light to the red and the most saturated tones I'll apply on top. In this workflow, tones are the main protagonists, and thanks to the large targets easy to model, I do most of the volumetric work directly with strong, saturated tones. Even if I don't rely too much on transparency here, inks are always a great choice to let the underpainting play its part, without the need of dilution and extra time-consuming steps. And of course, their crazy saturation gives me in one step the punch of color I need to grab the attention of the viewer. The general scheme of the army is based on natural desaturated brown and green hues, and red is the eye-catching accent of the iconic shields and heraldry. So on this uh, named hero, I really want to push its presence and impact to the maximum, like a clear sign of his status in the hierarchy of their society. From the technical point of view, the progression is very simple and straightforward, following its natural evolution on the color wheel, moving from red to magenta and violet. I start with the brightest main red tone, extending its presence on an area larger than what I want in the end, so I can use a good border on its edge to build up a gentle transition into magenta, and I do the same on its connection with violet. From here I move to the more grounded and more natural sensations of brown. As you can see, I'm adding new color, but using a lighter hand to obtain higher values from the overlap with the black and white sketch. I use it also here and there to start building some of the organic tones of the rotting environment. Here things become a bit more technical. I use a bluish turquoise as a cold finisher for the progression, and in a few hidden parts as a source of localized dark values. Turquoise has a greenish hue coming from the presence of a small quantity of pure yellow in its optical formulation, and this yellow note is brought out by the similar warm components of brown, making this overlap visually pleasant and easily compatible, and producing an organic cold green note. As a bonus, the optical mix of light application and light underpainting keeps the area in the high values suitable for these high spots. But at the same time, the high content of blue of this ambiguous color fuses well with violet, extending the movement of my shades on the natural circular path of the color wheel. In this case, the more aggressive application of a thicker layer over a darker, more opaque base produces deep shadows entirely made by pure colors. This way I obtain subtle cold shadows, in contrast with the warm lights that I'll paint later on top of the midtones, tying the model to the same environment in which the rest of the arm is virtually standing. I use the yellow note of raw sienna to base the skin, with a few soft, translucent layers. And I switch to pure green to create the shadows, modeling the round shapes of this area in a more precise way. The darker elements of legs, beak and mane are based with a new, more opaque layer of turquoise. Shaded with golden high flow shading grey, and a tiny bit of uh, pure black to close the reverse progression.
A light coat of uh, sprayed plague beater flesh is the source of the light acid green tones of my swamp base. Different inks and brands create a variety of inconsistent finishes, so I feel the need to fuse and uniform all these layers under a thin coat of matte varnish. But to be honest, in the grand scheme of this project, this is just a useful side effect, and I'll explain better the main benefit of this layer when we get to oils. I'm putting the accent on the big vulture, because the mouth of Mork, taken by itself, is more or less just a standard model, and it doesn't present uh, strange unusual challenges, at least not in this initial stage of color blocking. My process for him is completely based on the one used for the troops, because again, even if he is an epic named character, at the base level it must share the same core elements and foundation of the rest of the army. To keep this sense of uniformity and integration on heroes, I don't really change techniques or steps, but I make sure that the same paints and methods deliver more and deeper information. So in this stage of color blocking, I simply extend my palette using a wider variety of tones that will translate in a higher concentration of visual input and new high catching depth. I use 5 different tones, only to set the uncoherent nuances of the multiple rough patches that make his uh, seemingly black robes. And every single brown tone of the instant color line, just to prime all the little wood elements with a rich dynamic palette of random tones that creates the illusion of a tone of complexity and internal diversity without really doing more work than while using a single color. Remember that the speed painting motto is uh, work smarter, not harder. A quick note on the true metal effects. On the troops I use my patented recipe for metallic contrast paints, but this model has only few small metallic elements, without any extremely interesting volume or shape to highlight, so I use the same basic components, but with a denser and less fluid silver as a main ingredient and vessel for the color pigments of the inks. I lose their dynamic automatic rendering of the volumes over the sketch but I get a finer control of the brush strokes on the tiny details, and a higher saturation for the chromatic sensations that fall basically into just two categories. The strong bluish tones of the hero's heraldry, and the darker rusty details of the more trivial equipment. Adding inks into a neutral light silver, I can create almost every possible metallic shade, and thanks to the different specific weights of the pigments and the fluids inside the mixes, the look of the dry layer is full of values and depth, almost like metallic paint after a dark wash, but without losing anything of its metallic shine. I often talked about how to control the staining properties of an oil wash, but I never really showed you a practical example, because that's precisely the kind of stuff that I usually do only on large, complex models. The idea is that any kind of wash, but an oil wash in particular because of its uh, slower drying time, settles and binds to the previous layer in different ways, depending on the finish of that layer. In the microscopic level, a matte surface looks like this, and all these microspaces are able to grab and retain a crazy amount of paint and pigments that remain in these volumes, even if you clean the tangent surface with sponges, q-tips or even solvent, because they simply cannot physically reach these areas. The visual result is a stronger, more staining wash that will define even the smallest detail in a super sharp way, but it will also filter and change a bit the tones of the base layers, based on its color, value and opacity. On the other hand, a glossy finish creates a uniform barrier difficult to grab, and fluid paint moves by capillarity and gravity only into the large crevices. The major details get the dark definition, but the surface remains untouched, and it's extremely easy to clean. I already have a uniform matte finish, ready to absorb the new rich tones of my washes, but I don't want that strong impact on the whole model, 
especially not on the red parts of the wings, where I want to keep their original hue and their top saturation, getting a softer dark definition that better suits the realistic dense mass of fibers inside feathers. So I use my favorite gloss varnish to seal these parts. This is an old trick of tank and gunpla modeling that I'm really surprised never really moved into miniatures. Pledge Floor Gloss is a common water-based compound used to polish, renew and protect wooden floors. It's extremely fluid, it can be used directly in the airbrush and it creates in a single thin pass an incredibly glossy layer, with the strength and stability of a product made to literally walk on it. And I add a bit of glossiness also to the base, mostly to sell the idea of the wet vegetation. This layer dries in a few minutes, and I can immediately move to oil washes. I apply a fluid mix of black and magenta on the wings. A dark green on the vulture skin A mix of brown and magenta on the leather trophies And paints grey with a pinch of black on legs, beak and white feathers When the paint is still wet, I remove the excess with a gentle pass of soft makeup sponges. And while everything gets a bit of extra tones and grittiness from the washes, the red wings maintain all the original brightness and saturation. At this point, there's no trace of oil paint outside details and deepest shadows, so I can safely move back to acrylics for lights, textures and details. I'm sure you're curious about why I just don't keep using oils for these steps, especially considering that I've used the easy blending properties of oil paints on the smaller surfaces of the infantry models. The main reason is that I want the big bird and his wrinkly old master to be totally, absolutely not smooth. I want every single part of this model to give the idea of something coarse, rough and rugged, and dense heavy body acrylics with a minimal dilution are great to create these effects. The tones I have on the palette are more or less the same I've used in the previous stages. The key aspect to notice is that to mimic the warm environmental light that I applied on the rest of the army, all my tones tend to a warmer and lighter spectrum, mostly using a light warm skin tone to create the progression to the realistic warm light of a suffocating swamp. To create the rough, dry effect, almost everything from uh, this point forward is painted with a fine, aggressive stippling of dense paint, and all the work is done by the tip of the brush. The only exception that's probably more semantic than practical is my take on the wings, that's mostly based on thin lines of progressively lighter use to create a dense texture of the thick fibers of these uh, huge feathers. I have a ton of footage of all this brushwork, and if you want to see every single movement on my hand and brush, check the real-time video on my Patreon page. 
The work at this point is simple, but there are still a lot of extra little interesting things happening on the palette and in the main focal points of the model. This stage takes time, much more time than all the previous steps put together, but the use of a simple contained palette and a single constant general approach to brushstrokes and lights all over the model puts the brain on a kind of automatic, super efficient path, where the hand becomes more confident, faster and faster after every little dot. There is no more problem solving to do, because I'm working inside macro shapes that have already a well defined extension and development, and all I have to do is to steeple my way to just a couple of extreme lights. After assembling the individual pieces, I check and retouch all my extreme highlights. I've constantly kept an eye on the proportions of lights and shadows during the process but I like to be sure of having a believable up-down progression, where the high metallic elements in particular bounce back more shine and light than the parts in the shadows or facing downwards. And here is the final result. Man, I really missed painting monsters. The freedom and the possibilities of a bigger canvas full of empty space is super exciting. Working on these models as part of an army, the difficult part for me is always to decide when to stop, because it's really easy to fall into the mindset of proper display models. For this reason I like to start from the basic units, setting the general aesthetic and refining my process on the humble troops. This pushes me to find efficient general solutions, and on the wave of the initial inspiration, I always deliver something more on the single model. When I move to the heroes, 90% of the problem solving is done, and I have a good reference to regulate the visual output of the characters, still keeping everything in the reasonable time frame of a speed painting process. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys.